visitors. Thank you all for coming out this morning to and join us in while during all this snow and I mean it's the biggest snowfall of the season, so <laughs> Oh boy. You know without music life would be flat. <laughs> so if you'd like to stand, we're gonna start off with blessed assurance. <laughs> Let us pray. Loving Father, as we ask for your blessings on this service today, help us remember the birth of Jesus, that we share in the song of the angels, the gladness of the shepherds, and worship of the wise men. Close the door of hate and open the door of love all over the world. Let kindness come every day and good desires with every greeting. Deliver us from evil by the blessing which Christ brings and teach us to be merry with clean, clear hearts. Help us to simplify our activities and traditions so we can focus on you. Thank you for being the Prince of Peace, and we ask you for that supernatural peace to reign in our hearts. Lord, sometimes we forget that the Christmas story did not end in the stable, but continued as Jesus grew into a man, almost unnoticed by the world apart from his appearance at the temple, his spiritual home on earth. As we close the pages of last year and we begin the next chapter of our lives, may we grow in faith, in wisdom, and closer to you each and every day. To your praise and glory, we pray. Amen. 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 Our next song, He is Lord. to the call to worship. 
And so, dear brothers and sisters, I pledge with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let, Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and, and perfect. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I am thine, O Lord.
Joy's? If we have any Joy's, I don't have anybody to give it to. You got Joy's? Well, we got Victoria's Trio coming next Sunday. I didn't know if you were going to announce well, that. Well, I was going to announce the luncheon, sorry. but that's okay. Sorry, I didn't mean it. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, they've been here before, so you all know who they are, and I'll tell you, they're, they're ready to come. They're looking forward to it. So. Which we'll have a luncheon afterwards. That's what I was going to say. You have a luncheon afterwards. So if you haven't signed up, the sign-up sheet is next, is in the back. Janine, confess Janine. <laughs> totally understand. <laughs> yeah, we've had the red kettle here for a few weeks. We've collected uh, $310.73. Wow, very and good. And they said, yeah, they said we might do it in July, but they said that last year too, so let's hope that we can do it again. So we'll see. Very good. Good job. Very good. Also, um, um, the newsletter, if you have any articles that want to be put in the newsletter, make sure you get them to me because I'll be working on this week. So, all right. We'll go to our prayers. I'm going to, there we go. Okay, we have Bernice, Gina, Allie, Addie, Bob, Kurt, Franklin, Andrew, Janice, Arlen, Eric, and Doug. And we have Gary. Anita, Jeff, Percy family, Emma, Denise, the Infusion Buddies, Tiffany, Sh Sheila, <coughs> Stephanie, Pastor Jan Bond, and Amity United Methodist family. Um, I'm sure we all have some hands raised hands of unspoken. All right. You know, I I always need the Lord every yeah. hour. So it happens to be our next song. I need thee every hour. pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful to be here, and, and more than that, to know we're in your presence and that you are with us. Like Richard said, uh, we need you every hour, and just like the song says, we have you every hour, because you are always so good and so faithful to us, and uh, Father, far more faithful than we are to you, but you are merciful and gracious, and you're a God who never ceases to love us and care for us and look out for us, and especially at those times when we're probably not looking out for ourselves all that well. So we are grateful to you for all of your, your love and your mercy. And Lord, thank you for all you've done in our lives. We uh, lift up so many. We have so many needs and, and worries and problems that come. And folks uh, asking us uh, all the time, uh, would you pray for me? And folks are in trouble, Lord. And uh, many are suffering and hurting and struggling in so many different ways. But Father, we, uh, we pause now to call upon you for it's one thing to, uh, we, we can easily, uh, Lord, get consumed and overwhelmed by our problems and all the, the difficulties of, of life and all the needs that there are around us. But we lift them up to you, Heavenly Father, because you are never overwhelmed. Um, you're, we are sure your heart is grieved and you are touched with the feeling of our struggles and sorrows, but yet, Father, you're never overwhelmed. And so we come to you and we bow before you and lift up all of our our, our problems and our, our needs and all the folks that we are praying for, we, we lift them up to you for you are God Almighty and you can there's nothing that you cannot do for our good and for our, our best and for our blessings. So in faith, Lord, we think of the names we have mentioned, folks in, in trouble and 
folks who are hurting and um, again whatever the need uh, father some are in sorrow they're grieving the loss of loved ones not just recently but maybe for a long uh, a long time ago and the hearts are heavy and father uh, others are struggling through sickness or injury or our family problems or marriage problems or uh, just just all kinds of things father financial difficulties you you know the need and and father we uh, we know so many right now are uh, are are struggling with uh, the virus with the covid virus and father it's just been such a problem and such a, uh, a difficult situation for such a long time and uh, we don't know the exact answer but we know you the one who does and father we pray uh, by your healing mercies, that you would lift this, this burden from us. Uh, uh, see us through it, Father, but we pray that if it could be that uh, this, this blanket of, uh, of oppression and difficulty and struggle that we feel, and it has created so many other problems and so much doubt and uncertainty. Father, we just pray you'll shine your holy heavenly light upon us, uh, the, the whole world that uh, started to pray for our country, but Father, it's, it's the world. And uh, so we just pray that for, for healing. And we know uh, right now, Father, people are suffering and, and, uh, and, and dying. But, and so we pray uh, for healing and blessing where it is needed most. And families who stand by and worry and uh, a lot of times they can't go to the hospital or the nursing home or whatever. It's just, it's just so hard, Heavenly Father. But we know, again, all things are possible through you. And so as weak as we might be, we come to you. And you said that in, in our weakness, you would be made strong because your grace is always sufficient and so we claim that once again and affirm that once again today father and and in faith we uh, just lay ourselves before you and again pray for your richest blessing and according to uh, uh, whatever the need might be and continue to watch over us as we worship today and sing and look into your word and speak to us heavenly father touch us we pray and may we know for sure we have been in the very presence of of Almighty God. And Father, we lift up our prayer today through the powerful name of Jesus, our Amen. Lord and Savior, and pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, let's continue worshiping and giving thanks to the Lord through our giving of tithes and offerings. We'll ask the ushers to come. Father, we give because you have first given to us so freely and generously, and we pray that you'll take these gifts and uh, anoint them by your Holy Spirit and use them for the glory of God and the kingdom of God. In 
Jesus' name we pray. morning. The scripture reading today is from Philippians 3, verses 3 to 11. For it is we who are circumcision, who we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who puts no confidence in flesh. Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anyone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church as for righteousness based on the law of faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. And that ends the reading of God's mighty and powerful word. Yes, amen. Thank you, Jim. You may be seated. I'd like to take a moment of uh, personal privilege and uh, joy to welcome Armin and Sherry Apple to our service today. Ma many of you know the apples, I'm sure. Uh, from being in Hancock County a long time. I haven't been here all that time. I was here a long time ago. Uh, Armin, that was almost 40 years ago when I first came to Mohawk and after we finished seminary, so that's, uh, that's going to be a, a long time. But uh, uh, Mark uh, or, uh, kept in or touch or contact with Armin through Mark Holzhausen, and Mark said, we need to get together sometime. And Beck asked me a while back, Sherry, as she said, since I've been uh, filling in here, over the past few months, she said, has anybody from Mohawk come down while you're here? And, and, and not yet. You're the first to, to, to take the plunge and uh, be, to be that courageous. So I, I, Armin, I don't know if they forgot me or they did, uh, or they're just so glad to be rid of. I don't know which it is, but <laughs> no, it's one of those things. And we have seen a lot of the folks at Mohawk uh, through the years here and there, and that's always good. So anyway, just a real special treat to have you all here. And it means, means a lot. And Reminds us, reminds Becky and me of good days. And uh, Becky uh, would have been here. She'll be here along here later on. Uh, uh, our uh, our friend, our pastor at uh, Martinsville, uh, uh, he and uh, he has uh, found out he had uh, this week he has COVID, and kind of came up all of a sudden. They were kind of scrambling around for a preacher, and and uh, so they asked Becky to come and fill in there uh, today. So that's uh, that's what she's doing. And so think about her and pray for her. Although if you, it's over. So I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know if your prayer would do any good or not. But I'm sure, I'm sure it wouldn't hurt. Maybe, you know, maybe God doesn't exist in time. Maybe it's some. I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to get into the philosophy of time and eternity. We'll just leave that for, leave that for next week. For Christ's sake. Now, who is Pete? And why do we keep doing things for his sake? I mean, why Pete? I mean, why not John or, or Jim or Bill or somebody else? And, and why does it have to be a man? Couldn't we do things, you know, for, for Mary's sake or Judy's sake or whoever? Maybe you've uh, wondered uh, about things or declared things for the love of Mike. Uh, which the other Mark here today, he might have an opinion or two about that. Um, Pete was our uh, council chairperson at Martinsville, uh, but he would definitely decline uh, so much being done or attributed to his sake. Uh, we, uh, one of our churches, uh, we had a fellow named uh, Pete, and he he kind of insisted that things be done for his sake. Uh, he he was. Uh, um, his family and friends, everything revolved around Pete. He was one of those 
do dominant kind of personalities. And so a lot was done for his sake, uh, partly out of respect, partly by intimidation and a lot of things just to try to keep him happy. And you'll probably groan, oh, for Pete's sake, when I tell you that for Pete's sake day is coming up on February 26th. I don't know who makes these up, but that's, that's what I have learned. So I don't want anybody coming up on February 27th and saying, oh, for Pete's sake, I missed it. You know, so just stay ahead of it there. Well, some scholars uh, suggest that whoever coined the phrase uh, had St. Peter in mind. Uh, for Phrases like, uh, for Pete's sake and oh, for the love of Pete, are, are really mild oaths uh, that originated as substitutes for something s stronger. You know, like for Christ's sake or for God's sake or for the love of God and, and so on. For most people, uh, things like that, those kind of expressions, they just kind of get repeated uh, almost unconsciously, really don't mean that much. But in Philippians 3, which Jim read for us here in the, uh, this morning, these words, for Christ's sake, uh, are a life statement of mission and, and life purpose and, and the motive for living. Verse 7, Paul says, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Now, he's not being flippant or vulgar, throwing out a phrase here as he uses that matchless and holy name above all other names to express the singular turning point in his life. Most of us uh, know the story how Paul met uh, the Lord on the Damascus Road, and from that point on, everything was different. And so he says here in Philippians 3, whatever was before, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for Christ's sake, for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost, given up, put away all things. In fact, so much so that I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ. You see, for Christ's sake, everything is a loss by comparison. Now, the word in our English Bible's uh, sake is really a translation of the original Greek word dia, uh, a, a, a preposition which underscores my uh, point in this sermon series that while prepositions are relatively short words, they are long in their meaning and in their significance. Uh, the word dia can be translated because of or through or by on account of. Uh, and taking the sense of the latter on account of, Paul in his life, and what he's saying here in Philippians 3, he had done some accounting. Uh, and he, after taking all things into account, running some numbers, giving up all his former life, giving up everything for Jesus, well, it was a no-brainer. In, in the final cost-benefit analysis, weighing what he was giving up against what he was gaining in Christ, he, it wasn't even close. In Paul's cost-benefit accounting here, it's interesting in verse 7, they, he talks about gain, gains uh, being plural, referring to individual assets, but it, the, he counts them all as loss. Loss is singular, indicating that all the gains are not even worth naming or, or numbering, not, or, or not even worth being listed separately, but compared to Christ, they are all just come under a single category and a single word, loss. It's all just loss. All the qualifications, all the achievements, all the accomplishments of life for Paul to this point no longer mattered in comparison to Christ. Paul had learned the hard way that nothing he could do in his, in his human self would earn him salvation and earn him right standing with God. All of his hard work, all the meticulous law keeping, all of his zeal for the Jewish faith, it had gained him nothing. He, he had done all the right things. He had gone through all the right motions. He had said all the right words. He knew all the right people. And it still hadn't gotten him where he needed to be and wanted to be with God. He says it had gained him nothing. And indeed, that's our human condition. Isaiah chapter 64 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. The best we can do compared to the holiness of God, is a bunch of filthy rags, and who wants that? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and what? Fall short of the glory of God. And in our humanness, in our sinfulness, in our fallenness, 
we always fall short. We keep falling short of God's holiness. Later, Paul would affirm it in that passage that every Christian ought to know by heart, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved not by works, so that no one can boast. This is not of yourselves. It is a free gift of God. Now, again, Paul found that out the hard way. Uh, you remember the encounter on the uh, Damascus Road there, and, and it was doubt, uh, doubtless this, this crisis moment for Paul, this turning point for him that had sealed the deal and, and sealed the change. I mean, think about what happened to him on that day. Uh, he was on his way with some others to... Uh, persecute Christians because to him and his mind uh, they're heretics and, and blasphemers but there on the way he was uh, knocked down uh, by a blinding light from heaven from which the Lord identified himself to Paul identified himself unmistakably as the Lord he is the Lord I'm the one you're persecuting he made clear to Paul but not only in that bright light was he able to see the Lord as he had never seen him before you know what happens when we get in a bright light? We start to see ourselves for what we really are. Sometimes it's uh, you know, just as well as the, to be in the dim light you know, rather than you know, this, this high-definition TV and cameras. They, they, kept, they pick up everything. You know? and, uh, and in that bright light on the Damascus Road, it was like high def. And every, every th Paul began to see him. Uh, he began to be painfully aware of his sin and his foolishness and all of his misguided religious zeal. And he came to realize and finally having to admit that he'd been on the wrong track all along. So when Paul saw the Lord Jesus more clearly than ever before and started to realize his sin and his rebellion and understood all that Christ had done for him in his grace and in his mercy, in that bright light, all of Paul's accomplishments and human achievements and human righteousness became nothing more than garbage by comparison. Let's remember, too, that for Paul, for him to say, I count all things as loss, for Paul, that's considerable. Uh, the all things is, is no small thing. Uh, uh, it's saying a lot. His, his everything uh, was, was a lot to give up. By any normal measure of uh, worldly success, Paul had it. Uh, he was a citizen of a city called Tarsus, uh, a, a city within the Roman Empire uh, where only families of wealth and reputation were allowed to retain their native citizenship, even though part of the Roman Empire, indicating that Paul came from a family of, of wealthy Jews living in one of the leading cities. And they had raised their son in the lap of luxury. They had sent him to a Jewish school of theology in Jerusalem for religious training. Uh, we know from Paul's own accounts that he sat at the feet of uh, the, the well-known leading rabbi named Gamaliel, and Gamaliel had given Paul advanced training in Greek and uh, culture at the university in Tarsus. And so we come to Philippians 3, and, and Paul reflects that, and he, he lays out a pretty impressive resume. And verse 4 says, if anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the human, in the flesh, in the self, he says, well, I've got more. And he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And he's not... You know, it's, it's not bragging if you can back it up. And he wasn't bragging. He was just stating the fact. In regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, I was persecuting the Christian church because I thought they were a bunch of heretics. As for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. But now, Paul says, now, after meeting Christ, I consider all that rubbish in order to gain Christ. Now, the original Greek word tra here uh, translated to rubbish uh, if, if I may be just a tad indelicate, uh, I think most of us are country enough, uh, it, it, it literally means dung or manure is what it means. Now, now, again, I won't go into some of the more rude, impolite synonyms, um, but the, the point being, whatever I had, whatever I was, Paul says, for me now, it's just garbage and guano. But the big question is, why? Given that for what? What could, what could possibly be so valuable and so compelling to give up all that he had worked so long and so hard for? And think about it for yourself. What, what would you be willing to do? What would you be willing to give up for Christ's sake? 
And what would you be willing to do? What would you be willing to give up for the sake of lost souls in this world who know nothing of Christ, who are living life without direction and hope and meaning, who know nothing of God's love and salvation and the gift of our Savior on the cross, who, who have no hope beyond the grave? What would you give up? We have friends uh, whose son uh, recently graduated uh, from seminary. And uh, recently we were visiting and catching up a little and talking about uh, children and grandchildren and so on. And uh, we said, well, what's your, what's your son planning to do now that he's finished school? And they said, well, he and his wife are applying with a, a mission agency to uh, go do mission work in, in some other country. And I said, well, do you, do you know where? Do they know where they're going? He said, well, they, there's a couple of possibilities. They've told them that they're, they will either be going to a country in Europe, and before we start thinking that's uh, a mission easy street, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 Europe is quite the mission field uh, given the sad state of the Christian faith, increasing secularism and socialism and the whole thing. It will either be a country in Europe or it will be a country in the Middle East which they know but they can't name. They can't, they can't divulge what country it might be in the Middle East. Now think about that. You know, going to serve Christ, going to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to a place where your life is at risk even to mention it or even to mention Christ. Yet they will go if they are called. Now, why would anybody do that? I mean, look at all that Paul was giving up. I mean, for Christ's sake, Paul. And that's the whole thing. That's, the deal. that's exactly what it was. For Christ's sake. I count all things as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ that I may gain Christ for whose sake I have lost all things. And think about that. Why is that? Well, just to flesh it out a little bit. Uh, uh, for Christ's sake, what, Paul, what might Paul have had in mind? For one thing, he had experienced the surpassing love of Christ. Paul was lost. He was an outright enemy of, of Christ. And yet Jesus loved him and gave his life for him. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 says, Christ Jesus, this is Paul writing, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Now we read the Paul of Scripture and we quote his letters. We preach what he preached and try to understand the life and teaching of Paul. We, we, don't, we don't think of him this way. He said, oh, Jesus is the Savior of sinners of whom I am the worst. He says, for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might disp display his grace for all who believe. You know, you don't really re ever realize how great the love and grace of Jesus is until you get to the point where you know how much you need it and how desperately you'd be lost without it. But not only that, he saw in Christ surpassing virtue and character. That is, the perfect life of Jesus. You know, there's a, a word, a phrase getting thrown, a lot, uh, thrown around a lot these days, a a lot, uh, mostly about athletes. Somebody who's really good, somebody who's the best, the top, the best of all time, they're, 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 they're called the GOAT, G-O-A-T, which stands for the greatest of all time. And there's a lot of, you know, talk show discussion about who's the goat. Well, let me tell you, who's, let me save you a lot of time. Just, just go to the cross and get on your knees. The goat is the Lord Jesus Christ. You talk about living the good life, you're looking for somebody you can follow and somebody you can trust, consider Christ. Beautiful, complete, flawless. Every superlative you can think of applies to Christ and more. For example, in John chapter 8, verse 46, at one point Jesus confronted his critics and skeptics, and he, and, he, and, he, and he put it right to them. He said, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Now think about that. What person in his right mind would throw it out like that and say, can anyone convict, uh, convict me of sin or prove me guilty? Well, that, you could do that for me. That's easy. But they, nobody could. You can be sure if there were fault or, or defect found in Jesus, uh, they would have been glad to point it out. They would have been glad to expose it. Even Pilate, when it came to the cross, Pilate knew here was a man who didn't deserve the cross. He didn't deserve to be crucified. Luke 23, 14, Pilate said, I have examined him and found no basis for charges against him. 
That's what Paul, this is the person for whom Paul was willing to give up all things. And then Paul found in Christ unsurpassed teaching and life-giving truth. Even his enemies had to admit, John chapter 7, verse 46, no one ever spoke the way this man does. There's a reason the multitudes flocked uh, and, and hung on every word that Jesus spoke. And then there is his unsurpassed power. Who is this, they marveled, who commands the wind and the waves? Who casts out demons? Who makes the lame walk and the blind to see? Who walked out of his tomb on the third day? Which is how we know he's, he has unsurpassed mastery over life and death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Stirring unsurpassed, unshakable hope in all who believe. And then Jesus is unsurpassed compassion. He insisted the little children be allowed to come and receive his tender blessing. This one who spoke grace and mercy to a forgotten blind man who the crowds ignored on the side of the road as they passed. This compassionate Lord who, who gave a hated tax collector another chance and who lovingly confronted again, confronted Saul the persecutor and transformed him into Paul the apostle and the missionary. And then there is the surpassing greatness of his sacrifice to make atonement for the sins of mankind. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Or 1 John 4, verse 10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And perhaps Paul was thinking of the unsurpassed purpose that he was now given by the all-surpassing Christ, a purpose and a mission for now and for the rest of his life to answer God's call as an apostle an evangelist, and missionary, and to be an ambassador for Christ, which is what he was till the day he died in prison for preaching Christ. Ephesians 6, verse 20, Paul says, For the gospel's sake, I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So full was his heart, and so committed was he, and so consumed by this, this mission uh, for the unsaved, that he says, he goes so far as to say, in Romans chapter 9, verse 2, he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I, could, I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Paul was trying to reach people and let them know of the glorious good news, the saving good news of Jesus. And he goes so far as to say, he said, if I, if, if, it would, if I could give up my own soul in exchange for theirs, I would do it. That is passion for Jesus and passion for the gospel. Well, how do you explain that? Only the unsurpassed greatness of Christ could explain Paul's willingness to go that far. His passion for living was, in this passage, he, in Philippians, he says simply, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ, whether it be dying with him, whether it be rising with him. I just want to know Christ. And his, undi his undying passion was for every other person, for the entire world to know Christ too. And so for Christ's sake, he was willing to sacrifice all of his past, all of his achievements, his, all of his possessions, all of it. Because when you finally add it all up, it is nothing compared, compared to the surpassing greatness of Christ and who Christ is and what he has done and what a broken, fallen world could yet be if God's people would simply offer them Christ. You know, a, a, a number of years ago, and in fact, it was uh, when uh, we were still at Mohawk, uh, uh, we had a, a man in the community uh, who died and he died very suddenly. Uh, uh, his wife said the following morning when I was speaking with her, he said, well, he was feeling a little uncomfortable. He got up and uh, thought he'd be more comfortable in his chair in the, in the living room. And, and when she uh, got up the next morning, they found him there, and he had, he had passed on at some point uh, during the night. And we talked for a while and tried to offer what comfort we could. And, and uh, I never will forget one thing she said. She said, you know, 
we had plans to do this and we were going to do that. She listed a whole series of things. And, and she said, you know, but uh, she said the um, things that seemed so important yesterday, she said they don't matter a bit today. And you see, once Paul saw Jesus and experienced his saving mercy, yesterday's important things didn't matter much at all. For Pete's sake, well, good for Pete, whoever he is. For whose sake are you living? And for whose sake would you be willing to surrender at all? Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? It was for Christ, for Christ's sake, said Paul, that he was willing to give up everything for he had found no greater good, no higher purpose, no brighter glory, no more loving Savior, no more worthy Lord, and in the end, nothing or no one who mattered more. As Isaac Watts put it centuries ago in his great hymn, When I Survey, when I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, and my all. For Christ alone is worthy of our praise and our worship and our soul and our life and our all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for Jesus who gave all for us. And Father, try as we may, we will find, as Paul did, when it's, we, we finally add it all up, that there's, no, there's no, really no decision to be made. Father, uh, all that we have are in, the, in this world, all that this world can offer us uh, will always uh, fall short of who you are and your surpassing greatness. So may it be for each of us today that we remember that afresh and anew and, and bring all that we have to you and, and set it aside for for the purpose of following you and knowing you and serving you and, and telling others, telling the world of the good news of a Savior. In whose name we pray, amen. Again, and Richard, you come and lead us in the hymn, please. pastor for such a great message uh, please stand and the next song will be Lord I want to be a Christian Heavenly Father, this is our prayer today, uh, one that uh, only you can help us uh, to, to be answered. For Father, it, it's not within us, but living in you and you living in us, all things are possible. Help us truly this day to live in Christ and live for the sake of Christ. Today and in the coming week, we pray in his name. Amen.
Y'all have a blessed.